All right. We're going to do a quick recap on the ECI and ECEF frame. The ECI frame is the old fictitious frame. I call it the ether-centered uh, inertial frame. Reason being is they use this frame as an absolute point of reference to make their measurements because as we went over earlier, GPS is a timing measurement system. So they're making one-way trilateration measurements off of the speed of light. And without raising any alarms, they need a way to drive the measurements and then add in a little earth rotation correction after the fact. So they have this fictitious frame that they invent here that stationary doesn't move. So in their model of moving through the cosmos, this frame would experience six months of day and night. You know, so it's literally just an ether frame. It's, it's just, just a frame of mathematicians pretending to be physicists? Essentially, yeah. It's just used for calculating the distances to make everything proportional. Where it starts off the coordinate system with. And then we have the ECEF frame, right? So that's where they say, this is the ball frame that they live on where they rotate. Now they, instead of taking the measurement with respect to an absolute frame here, put it on the ground receiver and act like it came from here to here. And it's and like, this is like the final product of it. <laughs> like they're like, this is where it works. Even though it was taken here the whole time, right? they introduced a different way to look at it real quick and then brought it back to, to where they were at. And then they're like good to go now alan aren't these coordinate systems globes well as my boy shane pointed out we live in coordinate system simultaneity nice <laughs> where all these core where all these coordinate systems are relative and valid at the same time so we have cartesian rectangular cylindrical spherical so if we lived on a plane you could project all of this above us as it was happening on a, on a ball and going around a ball or you could have ellipses going over rectangles. It doesn't matter, boys. It's all the same. It can act like you couldn't math this out on a plane. Is insane. Your coordinate system is in common with the satellite's um, center of orbit, right? That's the origin. But if you plot your track across the surface of water in particular, those points will form the surface of the sphere. Right. So when I said the graticule, right, it's because okay. we're within it's the out, like, No. No, Shane, that's incorrect. Th those coordinates are in Cartesian form. That there's no graticule involved. It's a C Cartesian coordinate system. So it's a coordinate system tied to nothing and no one, and just number lines in space with no relative tied to anything. Is that what you're saying? It's tied to the center of the Earth. Oh, so um, it's tied to it's a data. mass of the Earth. Right. So a coordinate system. Uh, it's not well. Can't you be, have a datum, I guess. Yes. Yeah, it can't yeah. be without a datum. Sure. So it's got a geodesic datum in there. So what? I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying no. that. No. You know it does. So we no, have. No, no. It has an yeah. origin. That's all you need. A origin. Yeah. And, an origin and three orientations. Yeah, but an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system tied to nothing does it mean anything when you say the center of earth it's like yeah but that means that you have a longitude latitude gridded network called the graticule that you're doing no. things to but it absolutely you don't does. you don't need that you don't need that long at all in gps it's only there to to convert it to other projections and graticules so the raw gps coordinates are in that ecf frame xyz coordinates xyz is all you need because that's how the satellites describe their position that's, as well. ECF, so the satellites naturally right? orbit the center of mass, right? That's that's the, the assumption I'm making, I guess. X, Y, and Z of what, though? Is it not in the, within the ECEF? Is that not what that is? Yeah, so, so the X, Y, Z coordinate <laughs> frame is centered on the center of mass of Earth with the Z axis on the axis of rotation of the Earth. And I think for convention, X or Y is, you know, so, so that's the three orthogonal axes that yeah. are the ECF coordinate yeah. frame, right? Yeah, galactic, geocentric, geographic, ecliptic. These are all coordinate systems based on the same thing that you yeah. just said. So you said, you yeah, said yeah, that yeah. you can have it without this, but you live within this. So no, still yeah. But yeah. The ECF frame or GPS is centered on the center of, well, you could say it's on the center of mass of the Earth, but it's also on the center of the orbital path of the satellites. So that's the common... That, that is the reference point for, for GPS location. I mean, to be fair, I think this is what holds up most people in this argument. And I think what his position was when we started is most people. Look, I don't give a shit about relativity and stagnant corrections, but I know that this GPS shows me where I am on Google Earth, essentially, right? Like I can put the satellite, and that's not a bad argument. It's just hard for us to argue against that because it's a lot of education required. Yo. Well, let's start with the mass around the ball. So you want to go over the derivation for big G, Shane? 
So yeah, let's say based on Newton's law of gravitation, but then you have switching out of little a, little g, right? Because you have the downward acceleration, 9.8 meters a second squared. So start with like, say, f equals g over m1 of m2 over r squared. And then what you set up your comparison for the masses of m1, right? you got a torsion balance. You got to measure the torsion, <laughs> the torque, right? What t equals fd to derive g, g equals m1, m2 over t over r squared to give you some of the torque, T would be related to the force, T equals FD, and then T would be K prime. So then G, big G would just be K prime times R squared of M1 of M2 times D, leaving it G derived as M1 over M2 over D of K prime, which would be R squared. So then literally just by theta radius distance and the angle of that torsion, we can derive back to our constant G to get the 6.85, whatever it is. But that, that's where that comes from. So, it's, it's the the mass and the weight formula being changed out algebraically. That, that, that. But like, so yeah, that was the whole point of Cavendish and like to prove the gravitational okay, constant, yeah. which is based on a density, which means they didn't actually prove it at all, right? They indirectly inferred it, which is the whole argument that we have against it. When they're like, we know for sure that we've derived big G and it's like, well, no, you measured torsion and a bunch of forces and you inserted that you will, what must be left is the force, which is crazy. So, so I'm confused. So just, yeah, just flick through that. So you, yeah, like you've said, you've basically described how they used something like the Cavendish experiment to derive big G. Based on little G uh, and constant. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the purpose there though, little, yeah. was to show how they, you know, once you establish the constants, they applied those to the sky. That was the, what they immediately did afterwards, right? Once they had a big G and a big M for the sun, for the earth and for, for or G for the constant, right? They immediately applied that the uh, Kepler's laws and Newton, you know, and, and interjecting Newton stuff in there so that they could get the mass off of those constants and they applied it to the sun. And then they were like, boom, now we got the mass of the sun because it's just algebra, right? They just reverse engineered what it would be off of the periodicity as a ratio of the two constants derived from Cavendish, which is just a ratio of downward acceleration, right? 9.8 meters per second squared, right? With no actual weighing of the earth. And they apply that to all of cosmology and so that the things in the sky move because mass is attracting mass and, and based off of that angle measured in in Cavendish. And then the boys got together with interferometers and started measuring velocities. And they're like, oh, we can measure translational velocity. We can measure rotational, we can measure it all. It's all good. And then they're like, hey, you know what would be crazy? If we tried to measure the old earth through the cosmos, since we you know, applied all of our, all, all, all these derivations to it and told everyone that this is how it works. And they had no velocity component for the earth. They measured nothing for uh, the earth that would correspond to 30 kilometers a second, which was mandatory based off of uh, the dynamics of all the mass that they interjected everywhere to make their predictions. So there's supposed to be a 30 kilometer velocity in there somewhere. Then everything after that was coming up with explanations as to why you can't measure the motion, et cetera, et cetera, which we don't have to get into. But the point though, was the history on constants and ratios of constants, right? Because now when we when we look at satellites and they say, oh, this satellite's, you know, X, Y, Z in orbit, it's at 20,000 kilometer altitude, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all based off of big G and Newton's orbital mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. It's like with scale invariance, if it's, if it's in orbit due to another mechanism, right, electrostatics or what have you, and it's closer and it's just moving slower, you would not know the difference. You would have the same output and technology, the same coordinate systems, the same raw GPS data that would be referenced in the same graticule where you're like, oh, I'm only 30% off the gratty or, or 30 feet off the gratty. It's, dude, it would work the exact same and it would be based off of no such, it wouldn't be based off of rotating, I mean, uh, it wouldn't be based off of the center of a ball, right? That's a mathematical construct that's been given to us as a dynamic explanation as to why things in the, in the sky move. And that's never been experimentally shown to be true. All that anyone's ever shown is that things fall down and you could uh, derive 9.8 meters per second kinematically off of that. You know, calculate it, you're not derive it. That's, that's you're calculating G, you're not deriving G, but yeah, the, mm -hmm. the so <clears throat> I'm, I'm not a little unsure about the scale invariance thing because there's some things that are not linear there, right? So if you, cause I've seen that the argument around angular size and you know, shrink it all down, shrink it all up, everything remains the same. But the mass of the bodies doesn't scale with their angular size. Um, oh, there's the, a cubic, the, cubic the function there, of, right? The mass of what bodies? The sun and the planets. What's that, Meow? Sorry, you're breaking up there. What was that? The... What? 
So, Who knows what their masses are? Their masses are derived no, off no. of periodicity and constants. Yeah, but you're talking about the scale invariance of, of the of the relationship, and that that scale invariance breaks when you include mass as a function of apparent size. But there's a oh oh who's who's doing that? D- doing the scale invariance thing or the you know who's including mass? The mass cancels out in these equations only if, I, if you make it, some assumptions, right? So Kepler's yeah. law, you only cancel out the, the mass of the other planets because sun's big in relationship and you assume that they're orbiting orbiting center of mass. Same with satellites, right? That, that you yeah. you don't have to consider the mass of the satellite no, in, in the no, equation. No, I, I think there's a misconception of what's going on here. The masses are individually derived or you know, calculated as an output of the periodicity of their event. So there's no mass to be included. Like it, it, it's literally not needed to derive any of it so you could apply kepler's laws to a satellite in orbit and get the same you know assuming the same speeds right you would get the same orbital diameter but if it was closer it would just be it would just have a closer orbital diameter and be going slower you just wouldn't know yeah the the that that is assuming that there's a significant mass difference right one mass is no, so, no. But if you derive no, Kepler's no, no, laws no, no, from Gr- no, Newton, at, right? At all, you you at should all. retain M1 and M2. <laughs> Yo, they cancel out. You don't need them. And when they try to put them back, it gives no, them no. a decimal point. Yeah, dude. No, you do. Oh, go ahead. No, they only cancel out when you make the assumption that there's that M1 is insignificant compared to M2. Otherwise, in Kepler's law, that constant you get includes G times M plus M1 plus M2, right? You can make the simplification that because M2 is insignificant compared to M1, that that you can drop the other mass. That's the only reason you can cancel it. And the other reason you cancel it in that initial thing is because you're assuming that the orbit is um, around the center of mass. So that's why you can use the centripetal force versus gravitational in that equivalence, right? And if if you don't assume that, if you assume that they're orbiting around a barycenter, both both masses get retained in the relationship. Well, right. nobody. Go ahead, Shane. And like you have to do that to make sure that you increase the accuracy of the prediction of Jupiter's moon to which decimal place, and then not to do that, you get the same prediction to the accuracy of which decimal place. Do you know? No, I don't. It's the same decimal. Place. Literally, it's the no different. So. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So, <laughs> so, so the fact that that yeah. that the assumption I is, the is correct doesn't Hold mean. Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. There's still no mass involved, never was, right? It started with a backwards derivation of force of a of a of how of a how much a torsion beam is twisting, right? And then they applied periodicities to events where mass still cancelled out, and then they just backwards interjected it for what it would be to cause that event. So still no mass, right? And they're just applying it to other things. And then as Shane just pointed out. Right when you interject the mass back in, it doesn't even change the decimal places of accuracy. It's completely irrelevant. Right there know. is yeah. The, the yeah the the idea that it's required is completely you know it's, it's not it's not there it's not in the math so to speak right because in addition in the to math that, it's it it can be in the math and it's it's yeah. pretty much irrelevant. It would make That's no right. it would, yeah, yeah. It would make no difference. So I wouldn't, right. so like, you know, so yeah, it's so like to hinder or argument or on effect. It. Yeah, so how do you know all that and you still have that position? You seem to agree a lot. Yeah. So, so here's the thing, right? So you, you do that derivation, you, you make the simplification that the second mass is insignificant and it turns out that it is in, in observed measurements, right? But that's cool, it means your assumptions it, valid. And so it was the first mass. The same then applies to the satellite orbit, right? That the, 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 the orbital parameters there don't really aren't really impacted by that either. And you can just do the same same calculation for the orbital velocity without having to worry about both masses. So you, you don't calculate the mass, you can just apply Kepler's laws, essentially? So our, his position is our position? <laughs> is, uh, dude, I mean, it sounds no, like... No, no, you're misinterpreting my position. Sorry? So you're saying okay. that the mass doesn't matter. I'm saying that mathematically, the ratio of masses means that the, the smaller mass doesn't matter, that they, they're so ah, small yeah. in comparison well, to right. the main one, right? Uh, well, th- this brings yeah. us back to the ratio of the constant, right? So it doesn't matter 
about uh, if anyone's ever actually weighed the earth, right? It's just about having a constant established and then everything will be a ratio of that from accordingly, right? So what they did with Cavendish, now that the angle that they got for that, you know, super tight angle. Now they do modern renditions of it. You know, they do it in the classroom, et cetera. They get measurements that exceed that all the time, right? They throw those out because they already have, you know, what, what it is, what we know, we've been to the moon, so it has to be this value. So they'll look for it to be that like, cause there is a, some apparent oscillation to it, right? Otherwise there wouldn't be a measurement to be made, but that measurement that they get, when it exceeds that, they just ignore it. And then when they get it, they're like, oh look, we found Cavendish. Now the causal mechanism of it could be whatever, right? Now, if it was mass attracting mass, that would have been substantiated in interferometry with Newton, right? That's why they had to redefine all the physics over this stuff. They they literally, I mean, I could see the hubris of them establishing constants and then doing ratios of that to explain things and having units of measurement based off of that. And then just freaking out and going, oh my God, boys, we weighed the earth, we weighed the sky, like just going ham with it. Cause, it, cause it's, 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 it's crazy. I mean, they literally think they weighed the earth off of that, right? And then they tried to measure the like the resultant velocity of that, and it just wasn't there, bro. Consistently, dude. Kepler's third law from Newton modified is the only, the one and only way that anyone in this world can pretend to derive the mass of stellar objects. What we just went through, the derivation of Kepler's law, Newton, that little algebraic trick is the only way people pretend to know the masses of stars. Just saying. Oh yeah, but you, you you've got to have some <laughs> sub relationship, right? I like that you're like, yeah, it's true, but yes, no, ex <laughs> no, ex exactly, exactly. You can't bro. weigh you have, have those constants. Dude, like you it, can't measure dude. the radius of the Earth, right? You can only calculate. Dude, it. he's already on board, boys. So to... none of this changes the fact that GPS no, no, no. satellite orbits no, no, no. are physically what they claim to be. Well, well, hold on, hold on. No, no, it does explicitly, right? Because of the scale and variance and that mass relationship, right? That's never been substantiated, <laughs> right? The mass no, of the Earth, the propagation the of, of light is not what? scale invariant. Hold on one sec, brother. They would send it with offsets for the Doppler shift. It would, you would never know, dog. You think they're going to send something where you could backwards derive where, like anything from it? Like, come on. Just... So if, if I have a GPS signal arriving to me with a special Doppler shift just for me, how do they Doppler shift it for the guy 500 meters to the right, 1,000 meters to the right, 1,500 kilometers to the right? They can't why would it, shift the why, signal for everybody, why would it, right? Why would it be just for you? It would be the baseline well, that they send out. And then everyone so, so would the, get theirs accordingly. So the signal that I receive is Doppler shifted, right? Based on the speed of the mm -hmm. satellite. The Doppler shift for everybody that observes that satellite will be different based on where they are relative to the satellite's path. Yes, and if the signal's already offset, how is there going to be a discrepancy between their measurements and yours? What do you mean by offset? So for the the way that they can do Doppler and GPS is it's just like a they just send out multiple pulses. So they would just send it with an offset to their pulsation time. And then when everyone so, gets their signal, they're like, oh, look, it started from X, Y, Z. So the GPS signal comes in, you find it out of the noise with autocorrelation. So you end up with a local clock that is synchronized with the radio signal from the GPS. And it's the frequency shift in that local clock compared to the transmit clock that you use to measure Doppler. That means the frequency of the signal that everybody receives must be unique to each individual if they are manipulating the Doppler to make you think the satellite is traveling at the speed that it is. And then on top of that, they've got to make sure that your calculated time of flight the same identical signal works out for everybody as well. You can't do that. You can't have one transmitted signal, and you can prove they're the same signal because you can capture them independently, right? Have one transmitted signal, have two different Doppler shifts and different times of flight for individual receivers. You, you can't fake it. Without knowing where those individuals are and giving them their own special customized signal, no, it's already offset, and then you would just have the timing from the signal sent to receiver to get your distance, man. Like it's so every. I don't know, I don't know what to tell you beyond that. So every every signal transmission, right? So you get the navigation message. It's got a timestamp. You take the navigation message, 
you process it to work out the orbital parameters of the satellite. You then work out, use that, work out where the satellite was. You calculate the time of flight of the message to work out the distance, the pseudo range. You do this for four or five others or six others, and you use that to, to solve simultaneously XYZ coordinates for you, the time of flight, and time biases between you and the satellites. If you can capture that signal in another place, because the signal is common, right? Everybody gets the same signal. You, you, you will, yeah, you, you can't get a location fix to the precision you can get it if the signal is not correct. That's not where it is. So I, I'm looking at five satellites. They're all telling me where they are and what time it is. I get their signals, do the trilateration and work out where I am in 3D space relative to the satellites. If that timing and position is not uh, coherent, I won't be able to get my fix. And if, and it's coherent simultaneously for everybody that can see those satellites. This is the last time I'm going to say it, and then you can close on it. It's already sent with that. It'll all work out proportional. I still don't understand by work out proportional. Well, can I quote it's a fix and put it real quick then? Go ahead. Go, go right. for it. The people who first did it, they were like, hey, they noted that the data set they analyzed had been pre-processed, which is, again, this is the raw data that you're talking about, and corrected for SAGNAC effect. In this case, a first order change in the time of light, flight of radio signals between satellites and receivers, and justified making this correction by claiming that the SAGNAC effect was a relativistic effect and that it was second order in C, and therefore that the correction had negligible consequences in the analysis. But important part here is the raw data you're calling raw is pre-corrected for the SAGNAC effect. So then when it's in the ECF mm. and in your X, Y, and Z, right? And then you have it applied to a datum to get where you are in real time. Boom, right there is the pre-correction applied. So, No, I've read read that paper and it's not clear what this raw data is and how it was pre-corrected. So, so the raw data I'm talking about time, is the timing correction immediately. Yeah. So this timing correction is baked into the clock on the satellite, right? That's, but that doesn't change the fact here that the clock is the same for everybody. Right, they all get the same timestamp in their messages. Uh, that that clock time is skewed or um, adjusted based on there's three components to, to its adjustment: the relativistic, two relativistic ones, and I think Sagnax the other one. But but in any case, you get you get a clock in the satellite that is not ticking at the same rate as a clock on Earth, or it's made to tick at the same rate as a clock on Earth. But that doesn't change the fact that without applying any other relativistic corrections, you can get a fix to within, say, 50 or 60 metres just by calculating time of flight of the signal. Based off of a coordinate system that it's sent with when it sends the signal for the timing, right? Yeah, that's yeah. why it'll all be That's proportional. It. All right. Yeah, we're, we're slightly in agreement. 